Okay, are you guys ready to get started? Um, any questions on the chapter eight homework before we start on chapter nine? Okay, I guess I will start on chapter nine. Um, I'm also going to use the whiteboard instead of Excel, um, but if you do want me to um, put anything on Excel instead, just let me know. I think it was harder to follow in Excel than it is if I just write it on the board. Also, let me know if you can't see it. Um, I didn't have anybody say that they couldn't see it in the last class, but just um, let me know if you can't see anything. Uh, okay, so we're going to talk about Chapter 9 today. Chapter 9 is actually um, pretty easy. <clears throat> so um, it's responsibility accounting. We're going to be doing like ROI um, and just sort of seeing how companies are doing as a whole. So um, let's start the PowerPoint. And um, I think this is, let's see, yeah, you guys should be able to see the PowerPoint. If you can't, let me know. Uh, okay. So we're going to talk about centralization versus decentralization. Um, so if you think about a big company, centralization is um, a company, I should say, that sort of has different branches all over the place. A centralized company is where um, decisions are made from the top and then just sort of filter down. So those branches really don't have any say in what happens with management or merchandise or anything like that. Um, so like the military is pretty centralized. Um, you know, there isn't a whole lot of difference between what uh, a base on the West Coast versus a base on the East Coast does. Um, decentralized com uh, companies are those that um, whatever branch they happen to be in, they make the decisions um, as far as merchandising and um, sort of what happens throughout the, um, that particular branch. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about what, who's responsible for what. Again, it depends a lot on the particular company that you're with. Um, but let's talk about decentralization and I'll show you some examples. Um, so if a company ha is more decentralized, upper level doesn't have to make decisions for each particular branch. So they can make a lot more strategic decisions, long-term decisions. Um, your managers are able to really um, sort of be able to make decisions, run the business as they want to, and that can really help as far as placing people in the future um, and motivate them. Um, and then lower level managers, those that are in the branches a little bit below the head manager at those branches can really um, increase their responsibility, um, improves performance evaluation. So um, the other thing I wanted to do is I want to show you an example of, I do this on my regular classes um, and it's kind of fun. And so I wanted to make sure that, um, Let's see, McDonald's. Okay, there we go. So McDonald's, believe it or not, is actually relatively decentralized. Um, and so as far as internationally, uh, so I wanted to go over some of the stuff that they serve in other countries. Um, so this one is in China, and it looks like a macaroni and cheese uh, grilled sandwich. Um, and this one is in Japan. Ah, sorry about that. It's a croquette burger. Um, <clears throat> so it's fried crab, macaroni. Probably don't serve it here. Poutine, if anybody's from the Midwest, they have that. Um, it's basically French fries and gravy. But <clears throat> in Canada, a mashed potato burger. In China, 
a melon float, Japan, um, spinach and Parmesan nuggets, Italy, a McLobster, um, this one sounds good, Cadbury egg, McFlurry in Australia, Canada, and the UK. A Mega Mac. Um, this one's interesting. French fries with um, chocolate sauce. A Cordon Bleu burger. Roll with bacon. That looks gross to me. China. An edible um, basket. Made with rice. What is this? Bread with Nutella. Okay. The Netherlands um, beef stew inside of your hamburger. Mm. Okay. Uh, so those are examples of a decentralized McDonald's. Um, so they have, oh, wait, you guys can't even see this. Crap, hold on. I forgot. Why didn't somebody tell me that all you can see is my boring PowerPoint? Hold on. I'll let you see pictures. Okay, can you guys see the, all of this food now? Harry was just talking about it, y'all couldn't see it. Okay. So here's the, you guys can see this, okay? The bacon. Yeah. That's not yeah. half as bad as what I pictured. Really? I mean, macaroni, bacon, and cheese toasty. I can't believe you guys were just listening to me talk about this food and not seeing pictures. Okay, I'm sorry. All right. Um, so here's your macaroni and cheese grilled cheese sandwich, your croquette sandwich, your poutine, mashed potato burger. The melon float, that does not look like a natural color. Spinach and Parmesan nuggets, not chicken nuggets, spinach and Parmesan. The McLobster. Here's that Cadbury cream egg McFlurry. I'm surprised they don't have that here. The Mega Mac burger. Your um, french fries with chocolate and something else. What is it? A white chocolate and dark chocolate. Porto Blue Burger, bacon and bread. That looks gross. The edible basket. And the NYC bagel. Rice burger, Nutella, all right, so those are your um, decentralized McDonald's foods, super fun, right? Okay, let's work over here and go back to the PowerPoint. All right, so now y'all should be back on the PowerPoint. Um, sorry about that. Sorry you just had to listen to me drone on about weird food. Uh, okay. This gives an example of what decentralization looks like. So um, all of your decisions, and it doesn't necessarily have to be like different branches or different areas or whatever, um, really it just means that top management does not make all the decisions, that your middle managers are making decisions for whatever they happen to be managing. Oh, here's another example of an org chart. Again, uh, it's very dependent on which 
type of company you work for, but um, decisions are made more so here and more so um, here rather than everything is made at corporate headquarters. All right, so I'm gonna talk about this. This is um, like a good conceptual question on the exam, perhaps. Um, so you have a cost center, so that incurs expenses but does not generate revenue. So um, I'm gonna use insurance as, as an example. So um, the cost center in an insurance company would be that department that just pays claims. Um, the profit center, um, they incur, an organization that incurs expenses and generates revenue. So that would be in insurance, it would be sales and service and claims together. Uh, and then the investment center has those, but it also has the investment portion of it. So like with Geico, it would be um, Berkshire Hathaway has the investment part of it, and then they have sales and service and the claims. Uh, so in doing it this way, you can really narrow it down on who's responsible for what. Um, so <clears throat> we're comparing the expectations, not just for the company, but for each particular department. So it's just a way of breaking down um, even more when we're talking about like a flexible budget, even more than the company as a whole. So um, we can have, we can break it down for each responsibility center. Um, again, and we're comparing what we thought would happen versus what does happen. Um, and so we're just narrowing it down um, for each department. Okay, so uh, this one, for example, is just the furniture department. And then this is just the table department. So instead of looking at the budget as a whole, we're looking at it for each particular department. So um, like both of these pretty much sucked. Um, but at least you could narrow it down to how much they sucked. So the furniture, um, well, I guess as a percentage, it's, it's still, it's about 10% and this is about 5%. So um, furniture still sucked more than tables. Okay. Uh, and then they've broken it down, not only between what they make, but which phase each one of them is in. So the production department um, is tables that are actually being made as opposed to finishing and packaging. And then this is just the finishing and packaging department. So again, they're just breaking it down, being more specific um, with each of the reports. Okay. So this is as a whole. Um, so typically what would happen is you take a look at this first, this, inter this um, whole income statement and say, oh, that 41,350, that looks bad. Well, where did most of that come from? And then you would go back up and say, okay, well, tables, they didn't do so well. Um, let me go back even more. So, Furniture, they didn't do that well. Um, and then tables, well, they didn't do that well either. Um, and then you can really break it down between which one has the most responsibility for that 40,000 unfavorable. Um, and honestly, furniture was pretty poor, but then if you look at the tables within the furniture, you can see that that didn't do so well. And then they even get more specific with, okay, within that production, the department costs, and then within the department costs, the finishing department costs. So they're just breaking down each particular account to see where exactly that unfavorable variance came from. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is just, saying do you want to dive into each particular one is it cost effective for you and, and how cost effective would it be um so we can get as detailed or as not detailed as need be um and obviously software is going to do this for you uh, so it's not as i guess expensive as it could be um but 
you can break it down as specifically as you want to. You can break it down by particular transactions if need be. Okay. Managers should only be evaluated on revenue or cost they can control. That makes sense. I mean, why would they be evaluated on something they can't control, they have nothing to do with? Okay. Um, oops, let me go back up. This is just, um, and, and this, honestly, this does not happen as much as it should. So a lot of times these reports or these meetings are not timely. Um, they may be held months afterwards, which doesn't do you any good. Um, they're not regular, regularly held. Um, they may or may not be understandable. And then if you can't compare <clears throat> um, the budgeted and the actual amounts, it doesn't do you any good. So this is just some suggestions on um, ways to maximize these reports to help you. Okay, now we're gonna talk about um, being able to measure your performance as far as members are concerned. Um, so cost center, um, we're gonna evaluate cost control, quantity and quality of service, profit center, profitability, um, and then investment center is ROI and residual income. You guys have probably seen ROI before, um, but we're gonna talk about it again. Um, residual income you may not have seen before, so we're gonna go through that as well. Okay. So formula for um, ROI, operating income over operating assets. And notice that that says operating. So what that means is for operating income, if you have investment income, um, if you have income that does not have to do with the business, you're gonna take that out. You are not gonna use that. Um, and then as far as operating assets, um, operating assets, we're gonna talk about depreciation in a second, and that's where this sort of comes into play. So here they have their lumber, their home, and their furniture divisions. This is your income. This is your assets. If you go back up to the formula, and I would write this down, it's operating income over operating assets. So if you're looking at the ROA for each of these divisions, I think they do it for you. Um, the, IR, the ROI for lumber is far better than I shouldn't say far, but is better than home building and furniture manufacturing. Um, so return on uh, the, the ROI, return on income, basically means you, you buy your assets to help you make money in your business. So those assets that you've purchased, how well are they working for you? So it's, it's your return on investment, your investment in this case being your assets. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this talks about, again, why they use operating instead of total income and assets. So if they close a plant, that loss is after your operating income. So that has nothing to do with your operating income. So you wouldn't include that. Um, and again, if you buy and sell equipment and it's not your business, that comes after um, operating income. Okay, this is what I wanted to talk about with assets. So <clears throat> just because you have um, more or less depreciation can really affect your R ROI calculation. Um, so you have your original cost and then your book value. Well, if your asset because of depreciation is higher or lower, um, that can affect it significantly. So that's why we're using operating assets. I mean, everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, and then I'll say for the sake of the problems that you're gonna have, it's good, just gonna give you operating income and operating assets. <clears throat> okay, um, these two little formulas come in super handy as well, and um, 
I can promise you're going to be tested on ROA and margin and turnover. So make sure you know the, these three formulas. These two, margin and turnover, make up your um, regular ROI. So <clears throat> we talked about what ROI was. Now, margin is your operating income over your sales. That's for every sales dollar that you earn, how much is actually operating income. Okay, so if your sales are um, $100 and your operating income is a dollar, that means that it's 1%. For every dollar of income that you earn, or excuse me, for every dollar that you sell, one penny of that, 1% is actually in profit or operating income. And then your turnover is um, a look at how well your assets are working for you. So it's sales over operating assets. When you um, cross out your sales, you get your regular ROI. Any questions? Um, <clears throat> so instead of just doing regular ROI, we're going to do the margin and the turnover, which equals ROI. <clears throat> so your margin is over here, 10%, so 10 cents for every dollar. Um, and then your um, turnover is over here. So your assets basically make twice as much um, for you as what you bought them for. So when you multiply those together, it's 20%. Your ROI is 20%, okay? Um, so let's look at a couple of other examples. Okay, can you guys all see um, the problems now? We should be looking at exercise seven, I think is the first one we're gonna look at. Pretty good? Okay. So investment center shows operating income of uh, 7,500 and total operating assets of uh, 125,000. So again, it just gives you the operating numbers. Um, you can probably, hopefully, just calculate that. Hopefully, you saved the formula. Um, so go ahead and cal calculate your ROI on that, and then we'll get a little bit more complicated. So let me know if you cannot see my handy little board here. So, um, ROI, um, and then we have income um, of 7,500 and operating assets of 125. So your ROI is um, um, So again, income is 7,500 over 125. So in this case, your ROI is 6%. So your return on assets is 6%. Um, is that good? I don't know, it depends on the um, industry that you're in. All right, everybody okay with that? Any questions on that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, Let's go on to number eight. Um, so we um, calculate a return on investment of 10%. Sales are 300,000 and the amount of total operating assets is 320,000. So they wanna know what the return on investment is gonna be. What I would do if I were you is, um, Write out your formula. You're going to have to manipulate it a little bit, just with a little bit of algebra. So, um, your, remember your ROI. Can you see that low? I can't tell. Ish. Yeah. Okay. So, um,
Okay, so write this formula down and then plug in what you know at this point. So you know that this equals 10% and you know that your sales is um, 300,000. So how would you solve for your um, assets? Give you a few minutes to figure that out. If you have any questions, let me know. So if you're stuck, remember that this is talking about sales, uh, not operating income. So you need to figure out what your operating income is going to be. All right, so um, let me figure out operating income. If you turn this formula around, operating income is equals your assets, your operating assets um, times ROI, which, and they give you both of these. So your assets is 320 and your ROI is 10%. So that means that your um, income is 32,000. Okay, so that you're gonna need that part to figure out. Now let's take a look at A. So if, if expenses are reduced by 28,000 and sales remain unchanged, what will the ROI be? So you need to figure out what expenses are. Um, and it tells you right here that if sales are 300,000 and income is 32,000, the difference between that has to be your expenses. So your expenses are gonna be 300,000 minus 32,000. That's before you take into consideration part A. So um, figure out what this is and then subtract your additional 28,000 and then calculate your ROI again.
this new operating income number, um, if I put that over the same uh, asset number of 320,000, um, it's gonna give me a new ROI of 18.75%. So what questions do you have on that? You said you got, what did you get when you plugged them in? 18.75%. Okay, and you did that by doing, um, did you do like the margin times turnover to find that all and like plug in 28,000 for sales on both of them or? So you could do, well, what I did was I found my original expenses um, and then I subtracted it by the 28,000 that it said here, if, if you lowered 20 uh, expenses by 28,000. So my new expense number is um, 240,000. So then I just took my income minus my new expenses, or I should say sales, by my expenses to get my new um, operating income number, and then just did that over my old operating asset number. So basically I'm doing the same thing, I'm just doing algebra to sort of manipulate how we get it done, but it's the same process. It's just your um, income over your assets. I just had to use algebra to figure out what my new income number was. Just make sure that you know um, this, that you can take your um, formula of your operating assets, or excuse me, your operating income over your assets and be able to manipulate that. If you already know the ROI, how can you figure out what assets or what your income is? Any other questions on that? Um, for mine, I just added 28,000. Can you do that and then just divide by the 320? Okay. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so what she's saying is um, once you have um, operating, once you've found operating income, you can just add that 28,000 because that's this, if you have a 28,000 reduction in expenses, that's the same as increasing your income by 28,000. You can do it either way. Anything else? Let's do um, one similar to this. So you, I feel like. Maybe one more would be better. <clears throat> so very similar in this case. So and we have this time we have sales of 1.2 million. That, again, that's not income. We have to figure out what our expenses are. So we have um, sales of 1.2 million, and then we have operating assets of 800,000, and they have a 10% ROI. So the first step would be to figure out what your operating income is. So you know your assets, you know your sales. Well, if figure out what your um, operating income is, if you have a 10% ROI, um, and then either do what Abigail did or um, can do the more complicated version of what I did. Um, and if your expenses are reduced, how is your ROI going to change? So let me give you a few minutes on that and then we will talk about it. But first step is to figure out what your operating income is given sales ROI.
So your first step would be um, what is your actual operating income? And if you break down the formula, it's just um, your operating assets times your ROI. So your operating assets is 800,000 and your ROI is 10%. So your operating income before A um, is going to be 80,000. Any questions on that? Do you want me to write it on the board? Um, so if your operating uh, income is 80,000, you have a reduction of 20,000 in expenses. That's the same as an increase in income, operating income of 20,000. Um, so your new operating income is 100,000. I would just put that over your um, operating assets of 800,000, and that gives you a new ROI of 12.5%. Does anybody want me to write that up on the board? Yes, please. Okay. All right. So the first step would be to figure out what your operating income is. So operating income, um, if you break that formula down, it's just your operating asset. Operating assets times your ROI. Okay, so in this case, the operating assets is eight hundred thousand times the ROI of ten percent. So eighty thousand before Part A um, is our operating income. Well, and then it says, okay, well, what happens if we reduce our expenses by twenty thousand? We reduce our expenses by 20,000, that's going to increase our operating income by 20,000. So, our new operating income after the reduction of expenses is 100,000. So, then in order to find our new ROI, I'm just going to take 100,000, put it over my assets, and that gives me 12.5. Any questions on that? Okay. So then what I'm going to do <clears throat> go back to the PowerPoint. So this is just gonna basically kind of what we just did. So you're gonna have an increase in ROI if your sales increase, um, if your expenses decrease, which increases your income. And then um, if you increase the investment base. So uh, that's the third way that you can increase your ROI. And it just gives you an example of each one. Um, <clears throat> so increased sales but to 660,000 which increased operating income to 72,600 no change in operating assets so it just gives you a breakdown of um, how your ROI is going to change and again you can do it through the longer uh, part of ROI or you can just do the um, income over your assets. And then this is the difference in expenses. They're able to reduce their expenses. And then we had a um, smaller asset base in this example. which is why that depreciation I was talking about makes a big difference. Okay. Any questions on ROI? I know you guys have probably done ROI before, but any other questions on that? Okay. We're gonna talk about uh, residual income now. 
Um, <clears throat> so here is sort of what your residual income is. Um, this is just another way to look at profitability. It's um, the technical formula is operating income minus your investment charge. This is not going to give you a percentage. This is going to give you a dollar amount. So your investment charge is your operating as assets times your desired ROI. So this number, essentially, this residual income is going to give you how much in dollars is over what you want as far as ROI. I'll say that again. The residual income is a dollar amount and it's gonna give you the amount over your desired ROI, okay? Um, and the reason that we do this is, I think, I can't remember if it's in the PowerPoint, it's definitely in the book, but um, if your company has an average ROI of 15% um, and you have one division that has an ROI averaging 18% and they have an opportunity to invest in something that's going to give them that department an, an ROI of 16%. It's not as high as that division, but it's higher than the company as a whole. That manager in a decentralized company will probably not want to have that opportunity even though it will it will increase ROI as a whole for the company because that particular division um, it's lower than than their average, they're not going to want to do it. So that can sort of skew some decisions that managers make. Uh, so this is why we use residual income because it takes that part out. Uh, okay. So this is an example of ROI. So they earn 60,000 of operating income, uh, 300,000 of operating assets, and they have, they want 18% ROI. So um, you're just gonna plug it in. So it's gonna be your um, income minus the assets times the desired ROI. So they're gonna add 6,000 to that company um, above their desired ROI, okay? Any questions? Okay. <clears throat> um, so uh, this is what I was talking about with sub-optimization. Um, so managers cho choose to benefit themselves at the expense of the business. Um, that kind of gets rid of this. Um, it encourages managers to make profitable investments that may not necessarily seem particularly profitable using ROI, uh, but it does measure in absolute dollars. So um, a $6,000 residual income means something much different for, between a small business and Walmart, okay? So that could be a disadvantage. Um, okay. So let's take a look at um, some residual income examples. Okay, so we have a desired rate of return of 7.5%, um, and we're in charge of three investments. Vincent Centers, um, his center controls operations of 4 million, and, and they were to earn 480,000 in operating income. So let's go ahead and plug in those numbers and see what his uh, residual income would be. Okay. So residual income, the formula is your income, operating income, uh, minus your operating assets times the desired ROI. Okay. So in this case, your operating income was 480,000 minus 
the operating assets of four million times your ROI of seven point five percent. Okay. And I think you guys can all see the board at this point, hopefully, right? Okay. If you can't, let me know. Um, so that gives you, when you do this, that gives you an ROA, <clears throat> excuse me, a residual income of 180. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? Watch you do one on your own. Um, we're going to try 9B. I'm going to let you do this one. So desired rate of return is 10%. Um, we have operating income of 1.6 million, and we had 12.5 million operating assets. So what is their residual income? I'll give you a few minutes to plug that in. Anybody need more time? Okay. Um, so hopefully you got 350,000. Does anybody need me to write it on there or um, did everybody get that? Everybody got 350,000? Okay. Um, let's take a look. All right, so guess what? That's all we are gonna do for today. Um, so next class, we will finish up um, with chapter nine. There's not a whole lot left. And then I'll talk about the exam. So um, if you have any questions or you have any feedback about Board versus Excel, let me know. You can send me a text or send me an email. Um, but I, if I were you, I would also kind of get on um, McGraw-Hill and start maybe some of the homework and start some of the um, Learn Smart. It is an easier chapter, so um, you should be able to um, fly through that pretty quickly. Um, anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Okay, then we'll call it a day. Um, if you have any feedback, let me know, um, and then I'll see you on Thursday. That's all I got. All right. I'm gonna hang up.